In this video, I'm going to talk about how the gains from international trade can be illustrated in a supply and demand diagram. This is a good follow-up video to the earlier lesson I did on the gains of trade in a production possibilities diagram. In fact, I'm going to continue with the same examples used in that video and the previous video on comparative advantage. We're looking at the market for apples in both the United States of America and South Korea here. Our assumption is that the United States of America has a comparative advantage in apple production and exports apples to the rest of the world, including to South Korea, where apple producers are less efficient than in America. So on our graph, we can see that the domestic price of apples in the United States is determined by the domestic supply, that's the S-U-S, that's the U.S. supply, and the domestic demand, the U.S. demand. So our initial equilibrium price in both of these graphs assumes that neither country is trading with the rest of the world. I'll call this the U.S. price and the quantity demanded the U.S. quantity. Likewise, in South Korea, where the cost of producing apples is much higher, the price is higher. I'll call this price K for the Korean price and equilibrium quantity in South Korea. I'll label QK for the Korean quantity. Let's assume that initially neither country is trading in the market for apples. So the price and quantity in the market for apples is determined solely by the demand from American consumers and the supply from American producers and the demand from Korean consumers and the supply from Korean apple growers. What would happen if the market for apples were to open up and become international? How would the world demand for apples be seen in these two graphs? And how would the world supply of apples be seen in these two graphs? Let's look back at our assumptions again. The United States has a comparative advantage in apples. We can assume, therefore, that the U.S. produces apples at a lower cost than most other countries. In other words, the world demand for apples will set a price that is greater than the domestic equilibrium price in the United States. So I'm going to draw a world demand curve for apples in our graph on the left, which is going to be greater than the domestic demand for apples. Since in the entire world, there are more people who wish to buy apples than there are in the United States alone. The blue line that I've drawn here represents the world demand for apples as seen by the United States. You may ask, why is the world demand horizontal? The horizontal world demand curve reflects the fact that the demand for apples as seen by producers in the United States from the rest of the world is perfectly elastic. What this means is that the output of apples by American farmers has no impact on the world price of apples. So I'll call this world price PW. What this means is that American apple growers can sell as many apples as they want to the rest of the world at the price of PW. The question, therefore, is once the U.S. market has opened up the trade, how many apples will be exported and how many apples will be consumed domestically? At a price of PW, American consumers now pay more for their apples because they are competing with foreign consumers for demand. As the price rises from PUS to PW, the quantity demanded among American consumers correspondingly decreases. So I'll label this quantity the quantity demanded by the U.S. or QUS. However, due to the higher price, American apple growers will increase the quantity of apples that they produce and simply sell the surplus to the rest of the world. So at the price of PW, the quantity supplied by American apple growers, I'll call that QS, exceeds the quantity demanded by American consumers, which is QUS, However, this is not a disequilibrium, rather the excess supply of apples will be exported to the rest of the world. In this way, by opening up to the world market for apples, American apple growers clearly benefit because they are able to produce more apples and sell them for a higher price than they would be able to if the market were closed and they were only producing apples for the American consumer. So how can we show the gains from trade for the United States resulting from opening up to the international market? First, I'll outline the areas representing consumer surplus and producer surplus in the United States before trade. Before trade, the total welfare in the apple market was limited to the yellow and the blue triangles. What then happens when the U.S. opens its market to international trade? How is total welfare affected? One thing that will happen once the market is open to trade is that domestic U.S. consumers will have to pay more for their apples. So in fact, Domestic consumer surplus is now a smaller triangle than it was before trade. The yellow area represents domestic consumer surplus.
So on one hand, domestic consumers in the exporting country are made slightly worse off, since they have to pay more for their apples. However, to determine the effect on total welfare, we must now look at producer surplus. And, as we're going to see, due to the fact that they can sell their apples for a higher price and are producing more apples, domestic producers in the exporting country, that's the United States, experience an increase in their producer surplus. So what's the impact on total welfare in the market for apples in the United States? I'm going to shade the increase in total welfare in purple here. And we can interpret this purple area as the gains from trade for the exporting country. The purple shaded area on my graph represents the net increase in total welfare in the U.S. market for apples resulting from the market opening itself up to international trade. Due to its comparative advantage in apple production, U.S. apple producers enjoy more producer surplus, are able to sell more apples, and are able to charge a higher price for them. In the case of international trade, there is a loser in this case. In this case, however, there is a loser resulting from international trade. American consumers enjoy less consumer surplus than they would have without any trade at all due to the fact that they are now competing with foreign consumers for the limited apples being grown in America. Let's continue our analysis from the perspective of South Korea. Assume that in our graph on the right, South Korea has a closed apple market. It's not importing any apples. It's not exporting any apples. But what happens when the South Korean market opens itself up to international trade? As we can see, the world price for apples, shown in our graph on the left, is lower than the domestic price for apples within South Korea. So what ends up happening is the world supply curve lies below the domestic supply curve in South Korea, indicating that the world price is lower than the domestic price. The horizontal line represents the world supply of apples. Now why is this supply and not demand? To understand this, we need to know that South Korea has a comparative disadvantage in apple production. It will not be selling apples to the rest of the world. Rather, it will demand apples from the rest of the world. The world price is lower than the domestic price, but South Korea alone has no influence on the price of apples in the rest of the world. If demand for apples were to increase or decrease in South Korea, it would have no impact on the world price. Since South Koreans represent a relatively small number of apple consumers in a global market in which there are billions of apple consumers. Let's analyze the effect of opening itself up to trade on the market for apples in South Korea. Let's first look at the impact on consumers. Free trade for apples clearly benefits consumers. The world price is lower than the domestic price. Therefore, the quantity demanded of apples increases to QDK. I'll call that the quantity demanded in Korea after opening up to trade. However, Korean apple producers are clearly harmed, since at the lower price, the quantity supplied by Korean farmers will decrease. I'll call this point QSK. Now, normally when quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied, we have a shortage of apples. But in this case, that shortage will not exist because Korea can import those apples from the rest of the world. In this way, the total welfare in the market for apples in South Korea will increase because consumers will enjoy a larger area of consumer surplus than they would have when the market was closed to foreign competition. There is one loser in this case, however. Korean apple producers are worse off since they are going to sell fewer apples at a lower price. However, just like in our export market diagram, in the case of imports, there is a net increase in total welfare of the area I have shaded in purple. The purple triangle represents the gains from international trade South Korea enjoys because it has opened its apple market up to imports from the rest of the world. In our production possibilities lesson, we showed the gains of trade as an outward shift in the production possibilities of a country who chooses to specialize in the production of a good for which it has a lower opportunity cost in trade for the goods that it does not have a comparative advantage in. In our supply and demand diagrams, we can show the gains from trade as increases in the producer surplus enjoyed by the producers in a country that exports a particular good and an increase in the consumer surplus in the market for a good for which a country imports. The increase in total welfare shown in both of these graphs represent the gains from trade that the United States and South Korea enjoy from the specialization and trade of apples between the two countries.